Testament is foreign to modern people in many ways. And one of the most striking examples of a quote-unquote weird practice has to do with the very specific and often very messy ceremonies surrounding ritual sacrifice. Last episode, we saw how sacrifice is required by God, but we're going to continue this conversation and look at the specific sacrifices in the Old Testament in different occasions. There were sin offerings, peace offerings, and holocausts, which are burnt offerings. They also made use of bread, wine, food, and very often whole animals, as well as their blood and fat. Why? And more interesting to us today, what does this all represent about the Catholic Mass celebrated at your chapel this morning? On sspxpodcast.com slash mass, you'll be able to find all these episodes, videos, and resources. So now let's join Father William McGilvery for Episode 7, Types of Mass in the Old Testament Sacrifice. The next patriarch we'll look at is Moses. And again, this this past year, for the first time, I realized that, you know, as a child, we we hear the story of Moses and, you know, there's that there's that song. And I think, I don't know if it's Protestant or not, but it's, you know, let my people go, right? Um, and as a kid and up until last year, I thought it was just because God really liked the Jews and didn't <laughs> like them being in slavery, which yeah. is partly true, but... God interestingly put a condition in there. He said to Moses, and correct me if I'm wrong, Father, and or if I'm leading you down the wrong path. He told Moses, let my people go so that they can worship me. It wasn't exactly. just because God was being nice. Well, he was, but it was, they're not able to worship me while they're in bondage. Let them go so they can worship. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And I don't know what are the origins of that, that song, but I know, I know what you're referring to. Uh, and yeah. that is what we, what we all think of is, you know, Moses going before Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. Or Wasn't rather, that like in, know, a, speaking, in a Bing Crosby, like Holiday Inn, <laughs> like one of those old timey movies or something? I think so. Anyway. I wouldn't be surprised. But yeah. uh, it's funny because it shows, uh, it shows the Protestant mentality and, and more, uh, perhaps more specifically the American mentality uh, of, you know, liberty being an absolute good, right. but not having any specific purpose towards which it, it must be directed. Um, right. You know, just as long as you're free to act, it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is being free. Um, that's our American uh, error, uh, one of the, the chief errors of Americanism. Um, and uh, it, when we when we think of this episode, uh, you can see how kind of our, our modern liberal mentality is imposing itself anachronistically upon this, this historical episode in the way that we represent it to ourselves in popular culture. We're getting rid of the, the last part of the phrase, which gives to that liberty, which God w wished for his people, its finality, its direction. And, and that liberty was directed precisely to the, the worship of the one true God. Um, and it's in fact for the same reason that, uh, you know, God told Abraham, leave your people and go to the land that I'll show you. Um, it's for the same reason that Abraham is, or that, sorry, that God is going to rescue the descendants of, of Abraham from their slavery in Egypt um, so that they can go back to that land, which is a sacred land, which is dedicated to the worship of the one true God. And to be able to worship with the one true God, you have to um, separate yourself in a certain manner from those who, who do not worship him. Um, whether it be uh, Chaldea, Ur of the Chaldeans, where Abraham was, or whether it be Egypt, um, because when you when you uh, unite yourselves in, in close ties of friendship with people who who do not worship the true God, uh, inevitably you're going to be uh, corrupted by by their friendship. Um, and in fact, that's what we see is that uh, before the Israelites left Egypt, they were already being influenced by um, the pagan cults of of Egypt. In such a way that, in fact, all of the the mosaic sacrificial law, um, one of the the grand objections uh, objectives rather of that that mosaic sacrificial ritual, was to withdraw the the Hebrew people from these false cults, from the worship of these false gods, to which unfortunately they had already become rather accustomed in Egypt. Yeah. There there had already been a lot of idolatry into which they had fallen, um, and so many of the prescriptions of the law are going to be aimed precisely at, at removing them as much as possible from those idolatrous uh, cults and practices that they had learned in Egypt um, by directing them to do exactly the opposite of what the Egyptians had done when they were with the Egyptians. So yeah. we'll see that. But uh, yeah. we should perhaps return then to, to our present point. 
Um, because while we are going to talk about Moses, we're not yet at the point where, where God gives the law uh, to Moses on, on Mount Sinai. We're not there yet. Um, okay. But we see that um, even before, you know, even before Moses uh, succeeds in, in leading the people out of Egypt, as we were just saying, um, he's going to say to Pharaoh each time, let my people go to sacrifice to me. And it's not just once that he says that, it's it's multiple times. Um, I, I, there's at least, you know, three verses that I can find. Uh, it occurs twice in Exodus chapter 9, once in Exodus chapter 10, where um, where we, we have this phrase, you know, let my people go to sacrifice to me. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's even... Uh, some back and forth with Pharaoh as to the conditions under which the the people can go offer sacrifice. Moses insisting that it has to be all the people with uh, with their flocks, with everything. Um, this is Exodus uh, ten, uh, verse um, verse eight, or rather verse seven. Let's start there. Um, so Pharaoh's servants are. You know they're they're fed up with all these plagues which are making their lives miserable and so they actually kind of turn on pharaoh and say to him hey you know w w stop being so stubborn and just let these these people go worship their god like they want to do what's what's that going to do to us um just 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 give them a concession please because this is this is unbearable um mm -hmm. and uh so pharaoh under their pressure calls back moses and aaron and uh, says to them go sacrifice to the lord your god but who are they that shall go? Because Pharaoh only wants to allow, uh, you know, a limited number to go, you know, do this sacrifice, do your thing, then come back. Uh, and Moses says, we will go with our young and old, with our sons and daughters, with our sheep and herds, for it is the solemnity of the Lord our God. Mm. Um, you know, which has its practical utility. Uh, requiring yeah. that allows the entire people to escape with all their possessions. There, there is that reason. Um, but also, you know, uh, it, 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 that teaches a lesson at the same time, though, that in worshiping God, we, we give all that we have to him. Um, everyone is, is obliged to offer worship or to participate in those, those ritual acts. Um, and we give the best of what we have. It's yeah. the solemnity of the Lord our God. Yeah. Oh, that that, that is fascinating. Um, all right. The the next uh, important sacrifice that we have is is the Paschal Lamb. And was was the Paschal Lamb was this a thing? Forgive me for for not knowing this. I should. Was this a thing before the um, before the Jews were led out of Egypt, or was this a sort of a new? sacrifice that was instituted specifically to show uh the angel to pass over the the israelites house or so was this already a thing that god had commanded them to do or is this a new um i don't know form of liturgy that, that he instituted at this point sure so this is uh this is definitely new i mean obviously uh the Israelites had sacrificed lambs before. That's not new, but the way in which the lamb would be sacrificed, um, the spreading of its blood over the, the post of the doors, and particularly the purpose for which it was sacrificed, that was totally new. Um, and this is actually going to become, let's say, the central piece of, uh, of Old Testament liturgy, Old Testament worship. It's already the beginning of the Mosaic law, you might say, before it was given in its fullness on Sinai. Um, already God is, let's say he's beginning, the, the first prescriptions of Mosaic law come with this ritual of the Paschal Lamb, uh, before God, you know, cares to give anything else, even before the Ten Commandments, ironically, mm -hmm. uh, God is first revealing the ritual of the Paschal Lamb, um, which shows its central importance. Um, and uh, it's precisely in virtue of this sacrifice that God is going to free his people from Egypt, um, which represents itself the work of redemption. Um, so there's this beautiful parallel between the Paschal Lamb and Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Um, the, uh, and then the you know, crossing of the, the Red Sea. Um, which was, you know, th thanks to the fact that the Israelites were preserved from the destroying angel um, by the Paschal Lamb. They were in, in a condition where they could leave um, and cross the Red Sea. So in a sense, it's the Paschal Lamb which opened up that, that path for them. Um, and their crossing of the Red Sea is their way out of Egypt, out of servitude. Um, it, it changes them before they cross that sea. 
they are uh, not an independent people, but rather they're they're let's say a race. They're um, you know a collection of, of families who are all in servitude to a foreign power, and they're not governed by their own laws. Um, they're not free to worship the true God as they as they as they would like. Um, whereas when they cross that sea, they emerge as their own people. Um, free to worship God according to the laws and ceremonies that he prescribes. Mm. So it's a very mo- important moment. Um, and it, you know, so so the crossing of the Red Sea, that's going to signify the waters of baptism, uh, which forms the, 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 the new people of God, the church. Um, the church is, is formed and constituted as a society through the waters of baptism. Um, and the waters of baptism have their efficacy thanks to Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Um, so this is, you know, of all the figures of our Lord's passion and death, this is probably, you know, the most specific, the most rich, um, even more so, I would say, than the sacrifice of, of Isaac that we've already discussed. Um, and then, uh, you know, let's not forget either that in the midst of all this, there's also very explicit foreshadowing of the Holy Eucharist uh, because the Paschal Lamb is first sacrificed and then partaken of um, and the manner of its partaking is something which corresponds very well to the Holy Eucharist Um, you know so let's mention a few things there without necessarily quoting the entire text Um, the so all of the Paschal Lamb was to be eaten uh, by the the morning after Uh, you were not allowed to uh, waste any of it or simply keep it around as leftovers. It was all to be eaten, um, which, you know, signifies obviously that the Holy Eucharist is to be, is consecrated to be consumed uh, reverently, devoutly. It's not to be, you know, left indefinitely in the, in the tabernacle. Uh, we would, we don't allow the Eucharistic species to corrupt out of, out of negligence. Um, right. But uh, uh, let's say, the it was forbidden to carry uh, the how do you say it the um, the the paschal lamb what what remained of the paschal lamb after it was sacrificed its meat its flesh could not be carried out of the house um, mm. but each lamb was to be eaten in one house and uh, and and in that house only the house representing the church uh, because the mm. Eucharist is to be partaken of in the, in the Catholic Church in its you know visible <sighs> confines. You don't uh, carry it out to give it to Protestants or schismatics or what have you. Um, and it's only the circumcised who have the right to eat of that Paschal lamb and to, to, to partake in the ritual. Um, and it's very interesting to note, though, um, so circumcision is uh, like a prefiguring of baptism, just as circumcision leaves an indelible mark <laughs> on the body. So baptism leaves an indelible mark on the soul. And circumcision was a sign of belonging to the people of God. So is baptism. It's it's baptism which makes you a member of, of God's people, of his church. Um, and then we see as well, there was already a universality though with, with regard to this Paschal, this, uh, this Passover celebration because God said, uh, so uh, maybe here I'll quote the text. Um, so this this description of the Paschal Lamb and, and the ritual pertaining to it begins in Exodus chapter 12, uh, verse 3 and following. But um, with regard to prescriptions for strangers, um, that starts at, uh, let's see here, um, at verse 43. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the service of the, of the phase or Pasch. Uh, no foreigner shall eat of it. But every bought servant shall be circumcised, and so shall eat. The stranger and the hireling shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Neither shall you carry forth of the flesh thereof out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone thereof. All the assembly of the children of Israel shall shall keep it. And if any stranger be willing to dwell among you and to keep the phase of the Lord, all his males shall first be circumcised, and then shall he celebrate it according to the manner. And he shall be as he that is born in the land. But if any man be uncircumcised, he shall not eat thereof. The same law shall be to him that is born in the land and to the proselyte that sojourneth with you. So that shows that already anyone, in fact, uh, whether they belong to the chosen people or not, whether they were the offspring of Abraham or not, if they were willing to be circumcised and live according to the manner of the Jews, they were by that very fact admitted to partake of the Paschal Lamb. Um, 
which is already kind of a figure of the universality of the church. Um, no matter what tribe or nation you belong to, if you, uh, if you are baptized and you live according to the laws of the church, then you have the right to eat of the to partake of the Holy Eucharist, and no one no one no one can deny you that right uh, by reason of you know the color of your skin or the the language that you speak or what have you. Right. Oh, it's that's that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so the 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 lamb is killed, and the lamb is a prefiguration of Christ. Um, I see in your notes that you have a quote from Saint Thomas, and and he's going to dive a little deeper into the symbolism there. Yes. Um, so let's mention a few things there from St. Thomas's commentary. Um, first of all, one good resource for this is his commentary on the epistle to uh, the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, um, which touches on this subject. And there St. Thomas explains very concisely, but very clearly, that as that figurative lamb was immolated by the sons of Israel, so that the people of God might be freed from the striking angel, and so that they might cross the Red Sea, freed from their Egyptian servitude, so Christ was put to death by the sons of Israel, that, so that through his blood, the people of God might be freed from the devil's attacks and from the servitude of sin by baptism, which is, as it were, our crossing of the Red Sea. So that's the central point that we've already, already established, just uh, you know, summarized very clearly and concisely. And then as for some of the details of the ritual, um, so... Besides the things we've already mentioned, he, he says that the flesh of the, the lamb was roasted at the fire uh, to signify Christ's passion, you know, which is painful, like being roasted, or again, his charity, the charity with which he, his heart burned as he, as he gave his life for us. Um, and then it was eaten with unleavened bread to signify the blameless life of the faithful who partake of Christ's body. Um, as St. Paul says in, in his first letter to the Corinthians, let us feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, um, which is, by the way, the epistle that's read at, um, I want to say, the midnight mass uh, of Easter, uh, perhaps the day mass. I could be mixing that up. Uh, it's the day you. mass, I think. How day mass. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Um, yeah, I know. But, but uh, yes, we, we think like, okay, what's this whole thing about the unleavened bread? Well, leaven was considered to be, among other things, a symbol of corruption um, because of its tendency mm. to spread throughout the entire um, paste uh, very quickly. Uh, one, uh, and then also um, because it inflates, it puffs up like uh, like pride does to a person. I, I think that's the, the other reason. Um, in any case, it was considered to be a, a, a sign of corruption. And so unleavened bread is a sign of, of simplicity, of purity, um, of being untouched by any kind of corruption. And so that's the purity of, of heart with which we are to partake of the Eucharist. Um, that's why they had to eat unleavened bread. And at the same time, there was a wild lettuce, which is bitter, uh, mm -hmm. to denote repentance for sins, uh, because you have to repent, obviously, to partake of the Eucharist. Um, and then their loins, the loins of the Israelites were to be girt. Um, that's a sign of chastity. And their shoes, their, their feet were to be shod with shoes. Um, very interesting, but uh, th th this isn't obvious to us, but shoes were considered to be a sign of the examples of our dead ancestors. Um, hmm. Why that? Well, probably because when you follow someone's example, you are following in their footsteps, so to speak. And uh, uh -huh. so there's an idea of following, of walking. Shoes make it easier to walk, uh, and that's to follow someone. Maybe also, I don't know, because uh, shoes were, I think, made of leather at the time, and leather is from mm -hmm. a dead animal, so <laughs> that, would, that would be appropriate for dead people. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. In any case, that was the, that's the, the symbolism. Um, and, uh, and then finally, the staves or, or staffs, which they were to hold in their hands, denoted pastoral authority. Um, obviously, we, we are in pilgrimage in this life, but we, we, we do our pilgrimage in obedience to and following the guidance of, of lawful pastoral authority. And, uh, and then St. Thomas adds, as we said, uh, it was commanded that the Paschal Lamb should be eaten in one house, that is, in a Catholic church and not in the conventicles of heretics. <laughs> Very interesting. Wow, that's a it's a lot of symbolism there, and it's and it's really beautiful. Um, okay, let's move on from that to uh, Moses in particular, and we've we've mentioned him already, obviously, but 
um, as the as the chosen people are wandering in the desert and and they're you know getting ready to go to the promised land, this is when we start to get a lot of laws, a lot of prescriptions. The covenant gets broken, and so God adds more laws. The covenant gets broken again, and so God adds more laws um, on, on the part of the chosen people. So, mm -hmm. what what do we see in terms of development of liturgy in in the Mosaic times? Well, uh, this is obviously where Old Testament liturgy attains its you know highest degree of complexity and perfection. And so, Saint Thomas he has in his Summa uh, Theologica he has. Uh, a section on the Mosaic Law. In fact, he speaks of law in general, which is a very famous part of the Summa, um, uh, where he gives a definition of law, which has become classic. And then he treats of the old law, and then after that, the new law. And in treating of the old law, he divides it into uh, three branches. There are three kinds of, of laws or precepts in the old in, in the old law. There are the uh, moral precepts, which govern our, our moral actions, which determine what is right and what is wrong. Um, and then there are judicial precepts, which govern, uh, it's a, uh, they're, they're, they're like prescriptions as to how to deal with dif different kinds of crime, how to punish crime, um, things of that nature. And then finally, there are ceremonial precepts. Uh, so precepts specifying how to worship the true God in a way which is agreeable to him. And okay. uh, so he, he treats of the ceremonial precepts first in general, and then treating of the particulars. Uh, the, those precepts themselves he's going to subdivide into those that, that concern sacrifice, how to perform sacrifice properly. Um, those that concern the... Um, let's say the material things that are required for sacrifice, such as the tabernacle um, or later on the, the temple and the objects that are in it. And then also there are things called observances, um, which relate to, uh, let's say, things that, that help prepare the, um, help prepare the priest uh, to worthily accomplish his, his task. Um, and that would involve, uh, let's say, the, the vestments that he has to wear, um, various things that he has to do to maintain his, the standard of priestly holiness. Uh, and then more generally for the priest and the people as well, the avoidance of uh, certain kinds of food that are considered unclean. Um, all of that pertains to ceremonial law. Um, but what I'd like to do then in, in going through these passages of St. Thomas would be to start with, uh, well, actually, we're in, when we are in the prima secundae, so the first part of the second part of the Summa, question 101, article 2. Um, and so St. Thomas is going to talk about the purpose of these ceremonial laws in general. Um, he says that they have, in fact, a twofold purpose. One is literal. These laws, the literal signification of these laws is what they do to help uh, the Jewish people to worship God in a worthy way, quite simply. And then there's a, a figurative sense of these ceremonial laws, which is to say, um, you know, over and above giving God wor worthy worship, we also want by these ceremonies to prefigure something about our Lord Jesus Christ, about redemption, and even ultimately about eternal life. So that's the figurative sense, which is there in addition to the literal sense. Okay. Um, and St. Thomas explains that there, there's this difference between the ceremonies of the old law and those of the new, because those of the new law, um, well, and finally, between all of those, and then the uh, the worship which is given to God in heaven. In heaven, uh, there is no figurative sense of the worship that we give to God, um, because we don't need to represent God to, to ourselves under various symbols and, and visible images, because we see God face to face. And that's why in heaven, um, there is no figurative sense to the worship. <laughs> it's all literal, so to right. speak. Um, right. But here on earth, uh, there is a figurative sense. In, under the new law, uh, the worship that we do um, recalls to mind what Christ has already done, done for us, and then it prefigures um, the, the glory, the happiness of heaven. In the old law, there are two things that are prefigured, not only the glory of heaven, but also the coming of Christ and the work of the redemption. That too is prefigured. So when we talk about the, uh, the figurative sense or the symbolism of Old Testament worship, we have to keep in mind that it's actually pointing forward to two separate things. So there can often be more than one figurative sense. There can be a figurative sense reflecting what Christ is going to accomplish uh, when he comes to save us. 
but also at the same time, another layer of figurative signification referring to heaven, to eternal life. Okay. Wow. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of, we've talked about this a little bit before in terms of the prescriptions on the, the Paschal uh, Supper and, and the sacrifice there. A lot of complication there and, and the liturgy gets even more complicated as we move into this mosaic period. Um, we've touched on this a, a little bit already. Why so complicated? Why does God care about, I mean, I, I think it's in Exodus, or maybe Deuteronomy. There are, correct me if I'm wrong, two or three chapters about the priest needs to wear this type of garment sewn this way out of this type of fabric. Like it, it gets like minutely detailed and kind of outrageous to someone who's like, why does God care about details? So that's my question. Why does God care about details? Why make the Old Testament worship so complicated? <laughs> yes. Well, um, so first of all, if we look to the literal reason of worship, um, there is a, a simple answer, which is that you do have to have some degree of specificity in your worship uh, by the very fact that it is public worship. You want there to be consistency. And so if, you know, uh, Father Bob of the Aaronic Priesthood goes to the altar and worships in one way, and then, you know, Father Joe does it a totally different way the next time, uh, people don't know what to expect. Uh, it's disordered. It's messy. So so there is a, uh, there is a certain importance to rubrics, um, whether we're talking about the worship of the New Testament or the Old. And to be fair, while we, you know, we kind of hit on the Old Testament liturgical prescriptions as being excessively complicated and detailed. In fact, you know, if we look at all the rubrics that govern the celebration of the mass, the sacraments, all of that, there's an enormous amount of legislation that goes into that too. It's not easy to learn. It takes a lot of time and study. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I was an MC at the, at the semin seminary and, and preparing for a pontifical ceremony for Holy yeah. Week or for ordinations, it's enormous, the, the amount of complexity. Um, so we shouldn't exaggerate the complexity of Old Testament ceremony. Uh, it's actually, <laughs> it's not that much worse, uh, I would say, than, than what we have in, on, under the new law. Um, but, uh, you know, you could still argue that it is more complex and certainly more demanding in certain regards, such as, you know, abstaining from kinds of food that are considered to be uh, impure, all, all the prescriptions about legal impurity. Uh, if you touch this thing, if you deal with this kind of person, you're considered impure. You have to keep away from the temple and from worship for a certain number of days until you're considered to be legally purified. That That is more onerous for sure. Um, now, so why, why is this? Uh, why are these, why are there these particularly onerous things, which, which, are even you know more complex and more difficult to observe than the than than you know modern liturgical law. Um, it's above all because of the way in which the people of the Old Testament was prone to idolatry uh, in a way which you know fortunately we don't deal with that temptation in the same way in modern right. times. Um, and you know the problem that we see in in nations around us it, or people around us it tends to be you know atheism agnosticism uh protestantism um islam all of the, these different false religions or or lack of religion which all tends to diminish uh the the ways in which we would worship god um uh, you know, reducing it to merely, you know, reading scripture or singing some hymns. Um, but we don't have, in other words, to, to resume what I was trying to say in a few words, we don't have sacrifice being offered to pagan gods all around us like the Israelites had. And so there's no desire to emulate that and to offer idolatrous worship. Um, okay. So because we are fortunately preserved from that kind of temptation, um, we don't need all the safeguards that God put uh, into place for the people of the Old Testament, um, and which are reflected in the liturgical legislation, which is there precisely to counter and to do exactly the opposite of what the, the pagans were doing in their false uh, e evil rituals. Um, and so St. Thomas says then, because men served idols in many ways, uh, it was necessary, on the other hand, to devise many means of repressing every single one. 
and again to lay many obligations on such like men, in order that being burdened, as it were, by their duties to the divine worship, they might have no time for the service of idols. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So you had to spend so much time fulfilling all these Mosaic laws that you didn't even have the time to go worship uh, pagan idols, even if you wanted to. <laughs> well, idols, uh, devil's playground, all that stuff. I mean, they're not, go. God's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Between being idol and worshiping idols, it's not always a big difference, uh, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, and, and St. Thomas notes as well that, in fact, the, these liturgical prescriptions, aside from those dealing specifically with the Paschal Lamb, all the others, they weren't given until after the people had already f fallen into idolatry at the foot of Mount Sinai in worshiping the golden calves. Um, so that's when God you know, said, okay, you want to do that? Well, I'm going to just load you with all of these ceremonial prescriptions to make yeah. sure that you never do that again. <laughs> yeah. um, so the timing is, is quite significant. Um and then, uh, but then there's another uh, one final reason is because of the symbolic value of these ceremonies um, and, and even of the, the prescriptions regarding food and so on, um, all of that or, or practically all had a symbolic value. And so it was useful for the good, for those who weren't tempted towards idolatry, they too could benefit by these prescriptions because um, they were a help in fact to raise the mind to, to God in contemplation and to stimulate, to, to excite faith in the coming Redeemer. Um, so, so it was useful for good people to aid their, their prayer, their contemplation, and useful for the bad to turn them away from idolatry. Fascinating. Um, let's get into some of the specifics of the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. um, there were certain animals that were prescribed, and so maybe this is symbolic, uh, maybe this is practical, I'm, I'm not sure. So um, sure. what were the animals that were to be sacrificed, and, and what was the reason for that? Yep. So um, there were three kinds of quadrupeds to be offered in sacrifice, namely okay. oxen, sheep, and goats. Um, and then as for birds, generally the turtle dove and the dove, um, although in the cleansing of a leper, an offering was made of sparrows. So there's just a few kinds of, of animals, of quadrupeds and of birds. Um, and so there are literal reasons for this uh, specificity, and then there's figurative reasons. Uh, the first literal reason is to uh, prevent idolatry, um, because in Egypt, regarding those, those three kinds of quadrupeds, they were all animals considered to be uh, sacred in a certain way by the Egyptians, and therefore the, the Egyptians, while they sacrificed practically any other kind of animal in their, in their pagan worship, they did not sacrifice these. And so God told the Israelites, you're going to sacrifice oxen, you're going to sacrifice sheep, you're going to sacrifice goats, uh, precisely because those are the animals that are not sacrificed by the Egyptians. Um, the Egyptians, in fact, they worshipped sheep. <laughs> I, I don't know <laughs> if you've ever been a shepherd and you know how stupid sheep yeah. are. Uh, I don't know why you would get it into your head to worship them, but that's what they did. Right. They also reverenced the ram. Um, and we know that the ram is typically connected to the devil in, in uh, religious symbolism. The devil is represented as a, as a ram. Um, and then uh, they also employed oxen for agriculture, and they considered agriculture as something sacred. So these are all sacred animals that the Egyptians did not uh, sacrifice because they considered them sacred. Um, and therefore, we, the Israelites, were going to sacrifice them to show our detestation of these pagan cults. Okay. Um, moreover, it was fitting, even apart from that, that reason, it was fitting that these kinds of animals be sacrificed to God um, because, first of all, they are the, the, the ones that are chiefly responsible for sustaining human life. The oxen, which is, which, as we've said, is needed for agriculture, um, but, you know, sheep uh, and uh, rams, they're, they're, these kinds of livestock are all... Um, you know, uh, of use for, for man's sustenance. And since sacrifice is giving to God something which represents ourselves and our own lives, it's fitting that we give to God those things which are most necessary for our sustenance. Um, and moreover, we need to give God things that are clean, that are, that are you know, beautiful and fitting for his worship. And uh, these animals are particularly clean, both in themselves and in their, uh, their nourishment. Um, whereas other animals... They're either wild animals, um, so you know there's something savage about them that makes them unworthy of, of God, um, or if they are tamed, if they're domestic, um, they have unclean food, such as pigs, uh, you know, obviously, who 
uh, roll in the mud and, and eat just about anything, um, and geese as well. Um, so we want to offer animals to God that are tame and that are clean in their in their food and their habits. Um, so that's generally true of these these animals which were designated by God for ritual sacrifice. Okay. Um, and so um, by that very fact as well, the offering of these animals represents the, the sacrifice of our heart, which is to be pure. We're offered. We are supposed to offer to God a pure heart. Um. And then finally, these, these animals represented Christ or foreshadowed Christ in various ways. Um, uh, there's a, a scriptural commentary uh, from the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, which says that Christ is offered in the calf to show the strength of the cross, in the lamb to show his, his innocence, in the ram to foreshadow his headship, and in the goat to signify the likeness of sinful flesh. So these were the different animals, and these are the this 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 is the symbolism of them, which is which is fascinating. There are different kinds of sacrifices, though, as well, right? There's um, and it's interesting. We we don't really have that in in the new uh, new liturgy in the New Testament, um, or maybe we do. Now I'm curious. <laughs> well, uh, there is an article in the Summa which I didn't include in the notes, but. Um, it's uh, we're in the in the tertia pars, so in the third part of the Summa, Saint Thomas is uh, commenting on the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, treating of its you know efficacy for our redemption. And there is an article there under that question concerning his death, which asks if our Lord on the cross was at the same time a holocaust, a uh, burnt offering for sin, and, uh, and uh, a peace offering. Um, which are the three kinds of sacrifice in the Old Testament. And St. Thomas answers saying, yes, our Lord in his one sacrifice contained the perfection of all three, uh, all, all these three kinds of, of sacrifice of the Old Testament. So okay. I invite then our listeners to go there if they're interested. Um, but uh, for now, we can, we can then treat of the literal signification of these three kinds of sacrifices, um, as explained by St. Thomas in his commentary on the Old Law. Um, there's first of all the Holocaust, which is the most perfect kind. Um, it's, uh, as I already mentioned, it's a word meaning all burnt, entirely consumed. Um, and uh, this is the most perfect kind of sacrifice because it's um, offered to God in its entirety um, to show special reverence for his majesty and love of his goodness. Um, so it's, it's, let's say, if in general, exterior sacrifice is representing the interior dispositions of our soul, this is a sacrifice which shows disinterested love of God. You're simply going out to Him uh, without turning back on yourself in, by any kind of self-love or, or self-reflection, um, because the whole victim is offered to God, and those who offer or assist do not partake of it in any way. Um, and uh, so St. Thomas says... The uh, hole was burnt up so that as the whole animal, by being dissolved into vapor, soared aloft, so it might denote that the whole man and whatever belongs to him are subject to the authority of God and should be offered to him. Okay. So that's the Holocaust. And then next in, in rank and dignity was the sin offering, offered to God on account of man's need for the forgiveness of sin. And this typifies, I'm sorry, the state of penitence and satisfying for sin, um, so the purgative way in the spiritual life. Um, and it's divided into two parts because one part of the animal is burnt, but the other part is granted to the use of the priests um, so they can, they can eat uh, a certain part of the animal. We'll see in a moment what part that is. And uh, the fact that the priests can eat of it signifies that remission of sins is granted by God through the ministry of his priests. Um, okay. So the priests get to partake of the victim. It's primarily offered to God, but also the priests benefit from it um, because they are his ministers for the forg forgiveness of sins. And it seems to me, I haven't researched this in, in great detail, but it seems that it was actually the custom of the Jews um, that in bringing an animal for this kind of sin offering, uh, the person offering it for his sin would actually confess his sin to the priest receiving the victim. Um, and so there was already a kind of prefiguration of the sacrament of confession, which would come later on in the, in the new law. Okay. Um, but it's very interesting to note um, that in these peace offerings, 
So what, what part of the animal was given to the, the priests? It was specifically the breastbone and the right shoulder. Mm. Um, and this for two reasons. One, because there was a kind of divination, which is known as, <laughs> I don't know if I can say this, spatulamantia, uh, something like that. Um, because okay. spatula, uh, which is Latin for shoulder blade, um, so it was a kind of divination or mancia, um, which involved the use of an animal's sh shoulder blade um, and of its, uh, uh, let's see, of, of its breastbone as well, which were offered in sacrifice. Um, mm. So that's uh, so it was those things were withdrawn from the people's use. It was only the priests who could partake of thereof, so that the people wouldn't be inclined to this kind of uh, superstition. Um, but also, and I think this is this is more interesting. It's very beautiful. Um, this denotes the priest's need of wisdom in the heart um, to in instruct the people, which is signified by the breastbone, which covers the heart, and his need of fortitude in order to bear with human frailty. And this was signified by the right shoulder. Mm. The shoulders obviously being you know a place of strength, and particularly the, the right shoulder. That's the one that you lead with normally if you're <laughs> right-handed. So. Yeah, uh, strength and uh, and um, wisdom; those are the qualities needed by a priest. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, um, there's there's very specific rules about what parts of the animal, like we just saw, but also uh, specific rules about blood and fat, right? Yeah. Um, sorry. Let's uh, <laughs> let's not forget just a quick mention for the peace offering, which is that third kind of sacrifice. Um, oh, okay. And then we'll go on to blood and fat in just a moment. Um, but yeah, the, the peace offering. So if the, the sin offering, um, for that, you burn a part of the victim and you give another part to the priest. For the peace offering, everyone gets a share. So the priest and the, the people offering it. Um, and so it's the, less, the least perfect of the sacrifices because the least is given to God and the most is shared with the, the offers. Um, but uh, there's a symbolism to this. St. Thomas says that it's to signify that, so the, the, the peace offering, it's offered either in thanksgiving for benefits already received, or it's offered in petition to obtain benefits from God. Um, in both of these cases, this has to do with man's progress towards salvation. He's either thanking God for graces already received or asking of him further graces, which should be a help to achieving his salvation. And because salvation comes from God, through the direction of God's ministers, but also through the co cooperation of those who are saved. You know, as St. Augustine says, God who redeemed you without you will not save you without you. Um, mm -hmm. For that reason, everyone has a part in this sacrifice. God receives the, the majority of the victim, which is burned in his honor, but the priest receives some and the, the offerers receive some to reflect this theological truth. Very interesting. Wow. But uh, there wow. we go. Those are the three kinds of offerings. Uh, and then, yeah, if you want to go on to blood and fat, we can. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about let's, blood and fat. let's do blood and fat. Let's make a sausage. All right, that was dumb. <laughs> well, it's uh, I chose the, that title for that section to be pro provocative, obviously. Excellent. Uh, but uh, there is a special signification to these things, because what are the two things that... Um, always are, are offered in sacrifice and which are never partaken of by the people, not even in a, in a peace offering. Um, it's the blood of the victim and the fat of the victim. Those belong to God alone. And if you're a Jew, you never, you never, you know, drink blood, obviously, uh, and you never eat just pure fat. Um, these things are reserved to divine worship. Um, and St. Thomas says that the reason for this is firstly to prevent idolatry. Um, because the consumption of these two things, blood and fat, was common in idolatrous worship. Uh, as we see, there's a quote from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, saying, of those victims, they eat the fat and drank the wine of their drink offerings. So it's proof that it's, it was practiced in pagan worship. Um, but then secondly, to form the Israelites, uh, to form their morals, to help them to live rightly, because... <clears throat> Uh, by being forbidden the use of blood, the, they were taught to abhor the shedding of human blood. Um, mm -hmm. And likewise, by being forbidden to eat pure fat, um, that was to withdraw them from lasciviousness or from, you know, luxury, from, from impurity, all mm -hmm. of those things. Um, and then so, uh, thirdly, this was out of reverence for God because blood is uh, the, the element most necessary for life. Um, 
And in fact, in, in Leviticus, it said that uh, life is in the blood. Um, mm. So there's a close connection between blood and life. Um, and then fat is, is a sign of abundant nourishment. So in order to show that to God we owe both life and the sufficiency of all good things, the blood was poured out on the altar and the fat was burnt up in God's honor. Very interesting. And, and on that note, although it's not in St. Thomas, I would just mention in passing that that pouring out of the blood was considered to be the essential act of sacrifice in the, in the Old Testament. Um, it was not the act of butchering the animal, but the act of pouring out the, the blood of the animal already immolated on the altar, um, huh. which is why Levites were in fact authorized to kill the animal, but only the priest could pour out the blood on the altar. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, our Lord as well, let's say he is, he is in a sense, the priest pouring out his blood on the altar of his own body uh, mm -hmm. on the cross. Um, whereas other people can have a share in inflicting wounds on him, but, but he is the priest that, that pours out his blood. Okay. Um, anyways. Yeah, that's fascinating. And then, and then there's a foreshadowing, an element of, so that's precisely, precisely what is foreshadowed in the offering of blood. It's the, the shedding of Christ's blood, St. Thomas says. And then in the offering of fat, it's a foreshadowing of the abundance of Christ's charity. Excellent. Um, there are other substances that are used. Again, the, the, the sacrifices are very visceral, um, but there are substances of uh, food of, and of incense that are used in the uh, Jewish sacrifices as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we can just note that in, in passing, um, bread and wine were offered as well as certain seasonings such as oil and salt and uh, incense was burned in God's honor. And there were, there were sacrifices of incense, which denotes healing um, because of the sweet smell of, of the incense and the fact that it binds easily together. Um, as you know, to heal wounds, you it needs to bind together. Uh, you need the wound to close up. Um, so, anyways, these these elements were offered, um, and they foreshadowed Christ in various ways. Obviously, the bread can foreshadow Christ's flesh, and the wine his blood. Uh, oil betokens the grace of Christ. Uh, the name itself, Christ, means anointed one. Um, salt indicates the knowledge of Christ, um, and incense his prayer. Um, salt was offered because it wards off the corruption of putrefaction. You know, back in the days when you didn't have refrigerators, you'd have to preserve things like meat without being able to keep them cold. And so how do you do that? You do that by salting them. Um, and so sacrifices offered to God should be incorrupt, should be preserved from, from any kind of corruption. And so sacrifice was altered, uh, well, sorry, uh, salt was offered in, in sacrifice. And I believe that in fact, every victim had to be salted as a part of the sacrificial ritual. Um, and then, uh, it, but at the same time, so salt preserves from corruption, but it also gives flavor. So it signifies the discretion of wisdom. Um, and because it's painful, like salt in a wound, obviously, that hurts. Um, so salt indicates as well the mortification of the flesh. Okay. Very interesting. Um, what about, so that's that's salt and then uh, incense. Um, what about the other things? Again, there, there are a lot of prescriptions about where the sacrifice takes place, the tabernacle, the temple. Again, lots of writing about how many cubits and what it's made of and cedar and all that stuff, right? Yes. Right. Um, yeah, that's because uh, obviously the, the temple, the tabernacle, these things have um, you know, great importance in the literal sense because uh, you want the house of God to be worthy. And so, of course, God is going to uh, care that it be something, uh, take care that it be something which is worthy of him. Um especially given that there was only one of them. So, you know, <laughs> it's not like here where we have churches everywhere. Um, for the Israelites, there was only one authorized place of worship, which was the case precisely in order to confirm in their minds the truth that there's only one God. Whereas if you start dividing the places of, of worship and you worship here, worship there, then there's a tendency just because men like variety, they say, well, you know, here, under this tree, we're going to offer worship to this God. And over there on that mountain, it'll be, you know, I don't know, the God of, you know, under the tree, it'll be the God of vegetation. On the mountain, it'll be the God of rocks and firmness. I don't know. Uh, but d depending on the place, you start making a division in, in who you're worshiping and you start to worship multiple gods if you are worship, uh, worshiping in multiple places. So it was it was the, the having only one place of worship 
that was there to uh, uh, to to uh, strengthen the monotheism of the of the Jewish people. But since there's only one place of worship, uh, therefore it has to be really worthy. It has to be dignified. Um, but then, um, furthermore, th these uh, places were rich in in, in signification, uh, in prefiguring various things. Heaven, first of all, but also uh, our Lord and the, sacri the His sacrifice, the sacraments of the Church. So we'll go through some of those details. Okay. But um, even before that, we do know that obviously there are two two major phases um, in in terms of the place where sacrifice is offered. Because first there was the tabernacle, then the temple. Um, uh, this is obviously for practical reasons. When the, the 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 chosen people are wandering in the desert, you can't build a temple in the desert because you got to sure. move. <laughs> so that's right. easy to understand. Um, but you could ask, you know, why did it take so long for them to build a temple once they were in the promised land? It took you know practically forever. Um, there was, you know, obviously it was under Joshua that they entered the promised land, and then you have this long period with the judges, and then eventually you have you know Samuel, Saul. David, and it's only David who who is like the first one to get the idea of building a temple, which will be in fact realized or ac accomplished under under Solomon. Um, so why did God wait so long to build the temple? Um, Saint Thomas says there there are practical reasons for that. Um, one being that uh, you know at first, okay, even once the Israelites had entered into the Promised Land, they were still surrounded at first by enemies that they had to defeat, they had to chase away. Um, and so they couldn't build a temple while there were enemies all around them that were threatening to, you know, they, they, they could come in and occupy the temple and profane it. They could destroy it, you know, as would happen later on in, in Jewish history. Um, so God wanted them to wait until they had uh, obtained peace and had subjugated all their enemies, as happened only, you know, in the time of Solomon. Um, it was in his, under his reign that uh, finally the, there were no more wars with, with other nations. Um so it had to be in a time of peace. And then as well, there had to be a king under whose authority uh, the place for the building of the temple should be designated. Because if not, uh, there would be incessant wars among the various tribes of Israel as to which tribe would get to have the, the place of worship. Um, okay. And so that's why in order to fix definitively the place of worship, you had to have a king who could put an end to discord as to that subject by, by his sovereign authority. Okay. Oh, very interesting. Um, go ahead. Sorry. There is also a figurative reason for that, which is that uh, the two the the two different kinds of things, the tabernacle and the temple, they signify two states. Uh, the tabernacle is something changeable; it can easily be taken from one, one place to another, and so that signifies the present changeable life. Whereas the temple is, which is fixed and stable, is uh, a symbol of the eternal life, which is unchangeable. And uh, it's very interesting to see that in the building of the temple. Solomon uh, required that his workers, let's say, carve the stones to, to the proper shape, not on the construction site where they're putting everything together, but rather at the quarry itself where they're hewing out the, the, the stone uh, to build the temple. It's there that they have to cut everything to size. All the pieces have to be you know, pre-planned and cut to the right dimensions in advance so that when they take the stones to the construction site, all they have to do is put everything together almost like a, a Lego a Lego piece. Um, yeah. And so on the construction site, you didn't hear the sound of instruments, you know, banging of, of uh, you know, hammers, saws, whatever it would be. Um, you didn't hear the sound of instruments. And that's because the quarry is like this life where we, the, the stones of the, you know, the heavenly Jerusalem, we are um, forged, we are, we are uh, sculpted into the proper shape, which will allow us then to be transferred from the quarry of this life to the, the site where the heavenly Jerusalem is being built. And there, there's no suffering. There, you're not being sculpted anymore by, by work and by, by sufferings. Um, so we see then that, that um, foreshadowing of eternal life very clearly represented in the building of the temple, whereas it was not so clearly prefigured in the, in the building of the tabernacle. Great. Um, and then there was only one temple, and this is something that's uh, a, a big difference between the, the old law and the new law. In the new law, there are multiple churches, multiple sacrifices. Well, one sacrifice happening in multiple locations. Um, but in the old law, there's one place where you can do the sacrifice. That's it. 
That's right. Um, and we did already touch on this. Um, obviously, it was it was to help um, the Israelites avoid falling into polytheism uh, and worshiping dif- different gods in different places. But St. Thomas also says um, that this this is reflective of the fact that the Old Testament sacrifices were not efficacious of themselves for giving grace, and so there was no need to multiply them. Um, whereas under the new law, uh, you know, we can we can worship anywhere. We can have the sacrifice of the mass anywhere, and so the Mass is offered in many places throughout the whole world, because each Mass is of itself efficacious uh, to propitiate God and to draw down graces upon the world. So there is a real inherent value in multiplying uh, Masses, and therefore in in multiplying the places in which Mass can be offered. Very interesting. Um, and then in the in the temple, there are divisions, and, and this comes from early on the tabernacle was divided into multiple places. And I'm talking physically, there were divisions within the tabernacle and the temple. So we have the unity of one temple, but then why father the divisions within it? Yes. Well, um, that is because, um, in fact, the divisions signify the things in, in the temple or in the tabernacle signify the things that are subject to God and from which we arise to the worship of God. Um, and so, um, because there are, there's a multiplicity of creatures that are subject to God, it's natural that there be divisions in the temple, which represents those those created things. Um, and uh, so, in fact, let's just kind of lay out those divisions briefly. Um, there's three major compartments, so to speak. There's the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Um, and then there's the uh, the Holy Place or Sanctuary, where you have um, you have a um, an altar that or or a table with the bread, the loaves of proposition. You have a seven branched candlestick, and you have an altar of incense. And then, on the outside of the sanctuary, you have the outer court, which has the altar of uh, of holocausts and other bloody sacrifices. Um, so you have, and and that's the only part of the temple, by the way, in which the the Jewish people, um, the men at least, could assist and see what is being performed uh, uh, by by the priest. So the people were able to assist immediately at and, and witness the uh, bloody sacrifices of animals, but they could not witness directly the unbloody sacrifices which were offered in the form of bread and wine and uh, incense, um, and which took place in the sanctuary or the, the holy place, as it's called. And then... Okay. Even among so it was only the priests who could enter there to offer those unbloody sacrifices, and then the holy of holies itself could only be seen and entered into by the high priest once a year. So we have these three different compartments, and um, which signify three different places or states of the human race. The Holy of Holies obviously is representative of heaven um, into which our Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest, has entered. Uh, and it's only through him that we have the hope of ourselves entering into heaven. Um, mm-hmm. it's, that's where God dwells in the most perfect manner. That's that's where there's the Ark of the Covenant and the propitiatory upon which God is, is considered to, to sit. Um, so uh, that is the, the Holy of Holies. It's a figure of heaven. Um, and St. Thomas would say it's also a figure of the new law, um, in the sense that Christ has introduced us into the, the new law. Um, but uh, there's different ways of looking at it. The, the uh, holy place, that I think it's, uh, I think honestly, the, the most logical division, and this is what's presented in the introduction to, the Catholic introduction to the Bible, the, the Old Testament by Brant Petrie and uh, John Bergsma or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um they, they, they would say, and I think this is maybe more logical, that so obviously the Holy of Holies, that's heaven. Then the, the holy place, that would, be, that would signify the dispensation of the new covenant, the new law. Um, and then the exterior court is the old law. And that's logical because that's where the bloody mm. sacrifices were offered, which corresponds to the sacrifices of the old law. Um, in, the, in the new law, the only sacrifice which is d- offered on a daily basis, um, which is repeated, um, on a daily basis, that is an unbloody sacrifice. And so that's why in the in the holy place, representing the New Testament, you have only unbloody sacrifices. Um, and it's only the priests who entered there because 
at the time of, of these ceremonies in the, in the Old Testament times, it was only a few who were initiated into, uh, in a more explicit manner, into the mysteries concerning the New Testament and the coming Redeemer. It, it, you, it wasn't everyone who understood uh, the symbolism and how these different things reflected the, the work of redemption, which was yet to be accomplished. And so it was only a few who were the initiated who could penetrate that far um, so that they could be said to belong more to the New Testament than to the Old. Um, uh. and then the, the Holy of Holies, of course, uh, well, that's why, so in the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant, um, with a propitiatory, and that could be taken to represent particularly God, the father. Um, mm. whereas in the holy place, you have the, the seven branch candlestick, which obviously represents the gifts of the Holy ghost, or you could see even the, that the, the third divine person, God, the Holy ghost is represented, uh, in, in the holy place, as well as God, the son who could be taken to be represented by the uh, loaves of proposition, the bread, and there's also wine as well on that, that table with the loaves of proposition. So that's God the Son. Um, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost, both of them have temporal missions. They're both sent into the world um, by, by the Father. And so they leave the Holy of Holies, they leave heaven in a certain sense in order to come down on earth uh, by their temporal mission. Um, the God, the Son, is sent by the Father into this world. The Holy Ghost is sent by the Father and the Son um, to, on to, to to descend onto the church on the on Pentecost Sunday. And so it's it's natural that you have God the Father represented as always being behind that curtain in heaven. He has no temporal mission. He's not sent into this world like the Son and the Holy Ghost, whereas the the other two divine persons of the Holy Trinity have temporal missions. And so they manifest themselves, uh, in the, in the Holy place. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then inside the, inside the tabernacle, you've mentioned the, the curtain, but there are lots of other things that are there as well. There's candlesticks, there's loaves of bread. There's what, what, do, what are those things and what do they signify father? Right. So, um, in fact, St. Thomas would say that, um, there is essentially the same signification as regard to the, in regard to the concrete objects, the particular objects that are found in the in the holy of holies and in the holy place. Uh, both of them reflect or signify essentially the same thing, although it's more explicit. It's it's easier to understand in the holy place. Um, mm. So let me see if I can find the text to to pick up here um, with regard to that. Um, so here we are. Um, Saint Thomas says that there are. Uh, in fact, it's, it's best to start with the Holy of Holies, um, which signifies the higher world of spiritual substances. Hence, says St. Thomas, that tabernacle contained three things, namely the propitiatory, um, which is like the throne on which God is, is represented as sitting, although there's no image of God. He's invisible. He's a pure spirit. But the mm -hmm. propitiatory is like his throne. Uh, there's the two uh, cherubs. Uh, or cherubim, I don't know how to say this anymore in English. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the two angels are facing each other on either side of the propitiatory. Um, and then there's the Ark of the Covenant, which of which the upper surface is the propitiatory. So the Ark, though, itself is like a wooden box overlaid with gold. And inside of the Ark are uh, three other things. So the, the tablets of the law, the rod of Aaron, and the golden pot with manna. And so St. Thomas explains the symbolism of each one of these in, in turn. So first of all, the propitiatory uh, represents God himself, who is above all and incomprehensible to any creature, which is why, as I said, there's no likeness of him um, to, to denote precisely his invisibility, his spiritual nature. Um, but there is something to represent his seat, which is the propitiatory. Um, then there's the two angels. Um, which are, or the, there's the two cherubim, which signify the angels, and in general, one might say the blessed in heaven, who are looking one towards the other um, in order to show that they're at peace. And heaven is, is the, the, the place of perfect peace and, and harmony. Um, and then enclosed in the ark, um, you have uh, different objects, kind of like in the spiritual world, in the mind of God, you have the uh, archetypes or the uh, divine ideas which represent everything that God is to create. Um, and uh, so the things in the ark are s uh, symbolic of, of creation. Um, and uh, particularly of those things which are of greatest importance in human affairs, um, which are wisdom signified by the, the, the tablets of the, the law of God, the, the two tablets 
containing the Ten Commandments. Um, and then the power of governing, signified by the rod of Aaron. And finally, life, which is signified by the manna, which is an, a means of sustenance. Okay. Um, and then these th three things, wisdom, uh, power of governance, and life are signified as well by the objects in the holy place. So the candlestick would signify wisdom. Um, the altar of incense signifies the office of the priest, um, whose duty it is to present the prayers of the people to God. Um, so that corresponds to the rod of Aaron. It's, it's uh, spiritual authority uh, or priesthood. And then the table containing the loaves of pro proposition signifies life, the sustenance of life, just like the manna in the Holy of Holies. Um, but it's the, the manna, obviously, is a, a sweeter and more delicate kind of nourishment, whereas the, the ordinary bread, which is on the, uh, on the table of the loaves of proposition in the holy place, that's coarser and more general to signify, obviously, that, you know, yes, we have already spiritual life here on earth, but it's not as sweet and delicate and perfect as the life of the blessed in heaven. Right. Well, this is... That's fascinating. I, I love the, I don't know, there's, there's something that's always intrigued me about the, the design and, and the stuff that's inside the, the, the temple. And, and uh, it was really interesting to hear how that all kind of prefigures forward. And I'm looking forward to diving into that even more as we go. Um, what, what is your kind of takeaway, Father, as, as, a, as a priest, or what do you think priests would, would be able to gain from the, the knowledge that you've, you've done the research and we've done a you know, two hour plus episode on this. There's a lot of information, but what's a, what's one nugget that you found particularly interesting that will help you moving forward? Well, um, I think we need to constantly renew our appreciation of the richness of St. Thomas's teaching. Um, you know, the, these, uh, articles in the Summa on the Old Testament are not necessarily things that uh, one goes over in theology class in, in great detail. They may even be skipped because there's so many other things that, that seem to be of more practical importance. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is certainly an aid to our prayer and to priests in particular who are supposed to be well-versed in sacred scripture and in its meaning. Uh, I can say that as a seminarian, um, I read through the Old Testament several times without having you know ever encountered this commentary of St. Thomas. And so uh, it was very hard to savor and appreciate. And when I, when I read these things in St. Thomas for the first time, um, later on in my seminary years, I thought, oh my goodness, why does nobody talk about this? Um, yeah. This is so beautiful. And it also, you know, converts those passages of scripture, which when you're doing a scripture reading, they're pretty dry. It's hard to derive spiritual fruit from them. But if, if you have these in, keys uh, of interpretation in mind, if, if you have the key to, to unlock access to the, the spiritual meaning of these passages, they're so much more nourishing. Um, yeah. So I think it's just another proof for priests, especially of the, uh, of, of how worthwhile it is to study St. Thomas and uh, to go often to the Summa, uh, not only to, you know, avoid falling into heresy, but really to nourish our spiritual life. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, Father, thank you so much. Um, as school is wrapping up for you and, and we're recording this, uh, you, you did a, a marathon for us of, of research and, and of recording this. So thank you so much for your time and, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk with you again later on in this series. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your patience. Uh, this is probably of another one of these record breakers for <laughs> length of a it single been. podcast. Yeah. So. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> and uh, sorry, I, I always end up doing this to you, but that's all. No, right. no, no, it's great. It's good information. So thanks so much, Father. We'll talk to you right. soon. Thanks, Andrew. God bless. Bye.